Hello. Welcome to our webinar on agricultural commodities, livestock, and specialized crop prices, trends, and turnaround. Brought to you by CIFR, the Council on Agricultural and Food Agricultural and Resource Economics. My name is Gal Hachman, and I'm the CIFR board chair and professor at Rutgers University. It is my pleasure to be moderating today's webinar. Next. It's CIFAR's mission to translate high-level research and knowledge to a diverse audience that includes policymakers, elected officials, and federal administrators. When we demonstrate the value of the profession to these groups, the Council increases public appreciations for research, extension, outreach, and academic programs in agricultural and applied economics. Next. Before we get started, we just wanted to provide some background to today's topic. Prices of commodities, livestock, and specialized crops are important as they impact the economy, food security, rural communities, and the environment. Monitoring and understanding these prices are essential for government, businesses, and individuals involved in agriculture, and for policymakers and researchers studying the economic stability of global food systems. Commodity livestock and crop prices are integral to the agricultural sector, playing a critical role in directly affecting the income and livelihood of farmers and ranchers. Price changes, especially for necessities like grains and oil seeds, significantly impact inflation rates. High commodity prices can lead to increased production costs and in turn, higher consumer prices for food and other products. Food prices, particularly those related to staple crops, influence the affordability and accessibility of food for consumers. High and volatile food prices can impact food security, especially for vulnerable populations. In rural areas where agriculture is a primary source of income, commodity and livestock expenses directly affect the prosperity of communities, price changes that impact labor demand and rural employment rates. Prices of specialized crops influence the crops farmers choose to grow Livestock prices also affect the scale and method of livestock farming. For these reasons, CIFR has assembled three prominent experts to discuss commodity, livestock, and specialty crop prices and the factors affecting these trends. Next. CIFR has assembled a panel of experts to discuss this work, starting with Lance Honing who graduated from Kansas State University in 1990 with a degree in mathematics. His 32-year career with USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service, NAS, has spanned several NAS field offices, including Kansas, Indiana, North Dakota, as well as two tours at NAS headquarters in Washington, DC. He is a permanent member of the Agricultural Statistics Board for crops and oversees the NAS crop estimating program. Next. The next speaker is Tony Dorn, who is the branch chief of the Environmental, Economic, and Demographic Branch of the USDA National Agricultural Statistics Service, NAS. His branch is primarily responsible for analysis, estimation, and dissemination of NAS statistics for a wide variety of data series, including the Census of Agriculture, Organics, the Farm Labor Report, Local Foods, the Tenure Operation and Transitional of Agricultural Land, Land Ownership Report, and much, much more. Next. Travis Aviril is the branch chief for the United States Department of Agriculture, NAS, Statistics Division for Livestock in Washington, D.C. He serves as the agency's authoritative expert in monitoring and releasing livestock, poultry, and other animal production of agricultural data of 195 commodity reports annually. Travis is the subject matter expert in livestock, dairy, poultry, other animal products, and associated prices. Next. Before we start, we just wanted to explain how to ask questions during the webinar to make sure that you, the audience, knows how to engage. During the webinar, 
you can put questions to one or all of the speakers by typing it into the box in the control display access by clicking on the question drop down as shown in the slide and sending it to the organizer next please now without further ado i'll hand the webinar over to lance who will start us off all right thank you gal and thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon or morning depending on where you're at um, i'm going to move fairly quickly i've got quite a number of slides that i want to try to to cover we've got a ton of information here at nas and so we're really just going to scratch the surface a little bit uh, and how it kind of connects with uh, prices in particular that'll certainly be the focus of my talk so if we go to the next slide um, <clears throat> since i am up first i wanted to provide just a little bit of background information about nash you can see our mission statement at the top it's to provide timely accurate and useful statistics and service to u.s agriculture we are a statistical organization uh, a part of usda uh, so we are the official statistical arm of USDA, and by doing that, it means we publish a lot of information. In fact, we cover about 120 crop commodities, uh, 40 or so livestock commodities, uh, lots of economic and demographic statistics as well, and we do that with more than 400 reports uh, nationally that we put out each year. Uh, we get close to 10,000 reports across the country uh, year in and year out. In addition, to the census of agriculture every five years and so uh, it's a ton of information it's all made available to everyone at the same time and it's all scheduled in advance uh, in fact sometime within the next month uh, or so we'll be releasing the entire calendar for all the reports that will come out in 2024 and so you will know down to the minute uh, all the information that will be released next year so if you go to the next slide please uh, just a little bit on who NAS is. As I mentioned, we are the statistical arm of USDA. Uh, maybe it's more important to know what we're not. We're not political. We're not regulatory, and we are not policy making. We are, as I mentioned, a statistical organization, and so we are strictly about the numbers. Uh, we're relatively small. We've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 employees across our entire organization. Uh, and zero of those employees are political appointees. All the way to the top, our administrator, and everyone on down is a career uh, federal employee. And so that just kind of reiterates the fact that our only interest is for our estimates to be as accurate as possible. Uh, next slide, please. I won't read through this, but just a quick reminder to everybody that because we do gather a lot of information to support our statistics, uh, we will never, ever reveal any information about an individual who shares data with us. Uh, we ensure that everything that we publish uh, is not only accurate, but does not divulge any personal information about anyone who helps uh, support our statistics with the information they provide. Uh, next slide. Uh, so why do we do it? Uh, we do it for the good of agriculture. And so our information is used by everybody across the industry. It's used for many, many purposes, uh, depending on who you are in the industry, depends on how you use it. But the most important thing I want to point out here is the fact that it's equal access. As I mentioned, everybody gets this information at exactly the same time, and it's unbiased. There's a lot of information out there. Uh, across the industry talking about some of the same things that we report on, uh, but one of the advantages we bring is not only that equal as access aspect of it, but the fact that we're unbiased. We have no interest in anything other than being as accurate as possible, and so you can trust our numbers and you can know uh, when they're coming and what they're going to be. So next slide. This is just a little bit about how we're structured. Uh, I mentioned we have about 800 employees. We do have 12 regional field offices across the country, uh, as well as our headquarters unit here in Washington, DC. And then we also have a national facility out in St. Louis, uh, where some of our headquarters operations are as well. But by having these 12 regional field offices, it means we can also have boots on the ground, have folks available in virtually every state uh, to help support the local aspect of agriculture across the country as well. So next slide. I won't talk too much about the census. I know Tony's probably going to share a little bit of information about that, but because it is such a big part of what we do here at NASA, I just wanted to give it an extra shout out here. Uh, and this is a census year. 
And so it's really a big deal for us, but I'll let Tony share more about that in a few minutes. So next slide. All right, now for my part uh, of what I wanted to talk about today, uh, I'll move fairly quickly through this as well because even the crop price program specifically here at NAS is pretty detailed and pretty extensive. And so I'll try to at least scratch the surface and give you a taste of all the information that we have available, uh, kind of where it comes from, where you can find it, how it can be used, uh, and a little bit of a snapshot of kind of what it looks like. And so just very briefly, uh, to introduce the crop price program here at NAS. Uh, first off, just know that all the crop prices that we publish here at NAS are always average prices received by farmers. Obviously, as these commodities move through the various uh, portions of the marketing process, uh, they can be bought and sold multiple times. And so I think it's important to note that the price point that our estimates reflect are always back to what the farmer Receive. So it's at that initial sales point from the producer level uh, that we capture these prices. Uh, the frequency of the estimates that we provide on prices can vary everywhere from weekly, monthly to uh, annual. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about each of those uh, and where they apply. Uh, but one last definition I'll kind of provide for you. When we talk about these annual prices, we often use the term MYA or market year average. Uh, and so whenever we do these average type prices, we're averaging the prices across the entire marketing year for a crop season. And so again, it ties it back to what the farmer received, but we represent all the sales across the year. And so we typically uh, do what we can to weight that across the season and ensure that it represents all the marketings uh, that took place for the various uh, months throughout the year. So next slide. Lots of information here. I'm not gonna point out every item on here, but the next two or three slides just give you a quick snapshot of all the different prices that we provide, all the different commodities that we provide price estimates for. I've kind of grouped them into these categories with green headers. And then what I really wanted to point out to you here, you can refer back to these later if you need to, but the color scheme uh, for each of these commodities is, of course, I mentioned the frequency varies, and that's what these colors represent. Uh, peanuts would be the only commodity that we estimate and publish prices on a weekly basis. So you can see it's colored in yellow. Uh, but then there's two shades of blue for all these different commodities that I show we uh, publish price estimates for. And so if it is a darker shade of blue, like the barley, corn, and hay that you see, uh, that means that we publish not only uh, monthly prices, but we also publish those market year average prices at the end of the season as opposed to any of those commodities that you see listed with a lighter shade of blue, like the Proso Millet and Rye. Uh, we don't publish monthly prices for them, but we do represent the market year average price at the end of the season for each of these commodities as well. And so as you kind of glance at these next two or three slides, you'll be able to get a feel for just how broad uh, this program is for us and how wide uh, the group of commodities we provide information for this first slide, kind of highlighting what we would oftentimes call the field crop commodities, or a lot of times people just refer to these as commodity prices. Uh, but in reality, of course, we cover a lot more than just these major field crops. So if we go to the next slide, uh, here we can see the fruit and nut commodities that we also uh, publish prices for. Same color scheme applies here. So you can see we do publish uh, monthly prices for a number of the crops. Uh, but virtually every crop that we provide acreage yield and production estimates for uh, each season, we will at least provide a market year average price. And that also allows us to attribute uh, a total value to those commodities on an annual basis. And then the next slide is just going to show you the same information for our vegetable crops. And you can see there's quite a number of those as well. And quite a few of those that we do actually publish uh, monthly prices as well as those market year averages. So let's go to the next slide. I want to give you just a little bit of a taste of kind of where the information comes from. You know that we're publishing a lot of price information for these commodities, but what's it based on and where does it come from? And so it does vary just a little bit across these different uh, commodity groups. And so uh, kind of using those same categories as the slides I gave you for our field crops or uh, grains and oil seeds in particular. 
Uh, we do things a little bit differently than we do for a lot of the non-price statistical work that we do here at NAS. And that means that rather than getting information directly from the producers, we capture most of our price information for these commodities from the individuals who buy the products from the producers. Uh, we do that for a couple of reasons. One, because there's a lot fewer people buying than there are selling. And so obviously the pool is a lot smaller rather than burdening uh, thousands and thousands of farmers uh, month in and month out. We can actually go to these elevators and other commercial facilities uh, and just capture the purchases that they make directly from the farmers. Uh, the second reason that we do this is this also allows us to deal a lot more with what I would call office type situations. In other words, you're more likely to be able to get people referring directly to records to capture information. And so what basically what we do is we ask them on a monthly basis to report to us their total quantity that they purchased directly from producers and the total dollars that they paid uh, for each of these different crop commodities. And so it's a very exact uh, type reporting that we get to base this information on. And we use that same data then to not only estimate the monthly level prices, but then we can consolidate that uh, information all together to estimate our annual or market year average prices at the end of the season. Uh, when we look at our various fruit crops, the citrus crops, uh, most of the information we utilize on a monthly basis comes again from individuals who are making those purchases. Uh, when you get into some of these citrus type crops, you got way smaller number of people involved from a uh, purchasing standpoint. And so it's a fairly concise number of uh, contacts that we can make. And then on an annual basis, we will supplement some of that information uh, with data that we get directly from the producers. Uh, looking at the non-citrus fruits, uh, tree nuts, and the, or I'll just say the non-citrus fruits and the vegetables, uh, in particular, on a monthly basis, uh, rather than collecting information, we're literally utilizing data from our partners at the Ag Marketing Service here at USDA. Uh, specifically, they already capture some information on FOB shipping point price basis data. And so rather than duplicating efforts, we capture that information and then consolidate it into uh, some national level prices that we can publish on a monthly basis. Uh, at these specific commodity levels. Uh, we take that information as well as some information that we gather from the producers at the end of each growing season uh, and use that to produce our annual prices. And then for the tree nuts in particular, uh, we're not doing anything on a monthly basis there. And so we're typically relying mostly on information from uh, the producers at the end of, again, the marketing season. And for all of these commodities, anytime we can find any additional administrative sources uh, that might have information, we will augment that into our process to help reduce the burden uh, that we place on these reporting entities. So next slide, please. Uh, just the next couple of slides, just I wanted to highlight a little bit of the information that we do publish just to give you a taste of kind of what we have and why we have it. Uh, first, from a monthly standpoint, I talked a lot about the fact that we do publish some monthly prices. So just a, a quick snapshot here kind of shows you how you can utilize uh, some of that information. You can see uh, on the top left, you see uh, corn prices, soybeans top right. Uh, cotton lower left and winter wheat prices on the lower right. And for all of these charts here, you can see these are actually the monthly prices from 2019 uh, all the way up through uh, the last month that we have here in 2023. And so it really gives you a quick look at what are ha what's happening with these crops on a very frequent and ongoing basis. And so I think um, this is just an example of some of the items that we publish. If you go to the next slide, uh, kind of how some of this information can get used as one example. There's thousands of ways it gets used. Uh, but if you simply look at the um, what we call the price ratio between corn and soybeans, um, again, that same information plotted here, you can kind of see where those planting windows fall for these two crops. And a lot of times this will tell you a lot about kind of what the acreage distribution is going to be between corn and soybeans each season because what prices are around the time of planting has a big impact on which of these two crops farmers in, will actually plant. And so just one, as I mentioned, just one example of kind of how these data can be used in a very real way. Next slide. 
uh, when we look at some of these market year average prices or what's happening on an annual basis, it's really helpful to understand the trends uh, for what's happening in these various crops. And so here, uh, again, I actually took data back much further for the apple prices on the top left. You can see these are annual prices all the way back to 1909. Uh, for the potato prices on the top right, it's all the way back to 1866. Uh, almonds lower left, just back to 96, uh, back, and then 1866 for the tobacco one. So you can really see exactly uh, what's happening long-term uh, trend-wise with these prices with the data that we published. So next slide. Uh, so where can you find these data? It's great to know they exist, but you know, where can I find them if I want to use them? Uh, probably the greatest uh, place I would point out first would be our online database. We call it QuickStats. You can see the link uh, there included in the orange box. All this information you can go through and, and literally click uh, all the different choices that you want and spit it out into uh, a very easily digestible electronic format so you don't have to key it when you're finished. Uh, but if you want to see it in more of a publication type format as we release it on an ongoing basis from a crop perspective, two major uh, reports. There's our monthly agricultural prices report. So again, that monthly price data that we talked about, uh, we literally will have PDF publications that you can download on our website and look at it in more tabular format. Uh, or our annual crop values report that comes out in February each year, uh, highlighting those annual or market year average prices that we talked about and how they uh, translate into total values for the various crops that we're estimating. So next slide. Um, as I wrap things up, just one of the many ways, and I know Travis will probably share information on this as well, because he does the same thing, but one of the many ways we try to make sure that we're uh, communicating and being transparent with uh, the, not only the data we have, but the procedures we use. After all of the major uh, crop-related reports, uh, I'm typically out on X. I know it says Twitter on here. I'm getting used to calling it X. Uh, we have something we call stat chat, which means we'll do a one-on-one -on -one type interaction directly on Twitter. Uh, so if you've ever got questions after these major reports come out, if you come out an hour after the report's released, uh, if it's crop related, you'll be able to have a conversation directly with me, uh, get any questions that you have answered. That's just one of many ways to communicate with us. And then next slide. Uh, this is the last thing I have, just some contact information there. So you don't have to find me on X. You can always reach out via email or phone or whatever method you want. Uh, that's another thing that we pride ourselves on here at NAS is that we're very interactive. We're very transparent. Uh, and if you reach out with questions, we will absolutely get back to you in a very timely fashion. Uh, because as important as these data are and as useful as they are, uh, it is equally important that you understand uh, where they come from, how they come together, and what they represent. And so we want to make sure that happens uh, in whatever way that we can. So that's the last slide that I have. Um, I will turn the reins over. Thank you very much, Lance. Very interesting for the presentation. Uh, just before we move along, I wanted to remind everyone to send questions to the organizer using the question drop down menu. And I'll forward them to the uh, speakers uh, at the Q and A session. And now we're ready to hear from Tony Dorn. Tony, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Gail. So um, I just want to give you an overview of the NAS Environmental Economics and Demographics Branch. Uh, really, what how we're um, structured is that Lance has the crops commodities and prices. Travis has the livestock commodities and prices. And in the economics, environmental demographics branch, we have the price indices. So we put everything together in the prices paid and price is received indices. Uh, next slide, please. So our portfolio includes uh, quite a bit more than prices, census of agriculture, many other things. I won't go into all those, but you'll have those for your reference. Uh, next slide. So before we really get into prices, I thought I'd mention a little bit about the Census of Agriculture for a few slides, um, because although we're working at, slot, at uh, prices, the Census of Agriculture is really the only comprehensive state and county level source of information. So, uh, you know, it's conducted once every five years, 2022. It, 2022 is a reference year for the Census of Agriculture, but it's really a very important uh, data item to help 
dig down to the county level and to understand what's going on as far as agriculture at a micro level. And it's really a good snapshot over history uh, that can be compared across history more than any other data product and in more depth. So just wanna take a few moments to talk about what's going on right now with the history and current status of the census of agriculture. Uh, the first one was conducted in 1840 with 26 states in the department uh, in the District of Columbia. Every five years is when the census of ag is uh, conducted and information's on land use ownership, producer characteristics and demographics, and of course, production practices, income expenditures and more. And NAS in 1997 took over the uh, the Census of Agriculture from the Census Bureau. Next slide, please. Some considerations for this year, for 2022 and for overall. Uh, the definition of a farm is really important. It's any place from which at least $1,000 of agricultural products or producers sold or normally would have been sold during the census year. So that's very important when we're talking about farm counts. And now in 2022, there are operation operating counts uh, of only two items, farms and producers. So before that in 2017, and before it was a little bit different than that. In 2017, there were up to four producers that were accounted for as decision makers on each farm. And based on an expert panel, the we had past designations of principal producer in 2017, and before that principal operator. And those were removed really so that we could account for everyone's contributions to ag production, especially new and beginning farmers and female producers. So race and demographic content is expected to continue in the future, but one of the very important data items is race and demographics and how um, those kind of race and demographics breakouts into different sales, different geographic regions and all that is one of the very important data items or areas where census is very important and provides a special insight that only the census can. Next slide, please. The NAS Price Program, uh, this was in 2009, CFAIR uh, partnered with us to provide a review of the USDA NAS Agricultural Prices Program. And that's a very valuable uh, book of recommendations and overview that I still keep handy on my desk. And also just to mention something, I don't have it in the slide, but there is a com comprehensive over 300 pages document of methodology, um, that's actually based on one of the recommendations in the CFAIR report that we have online at www.nas.usda.gov. And if you click the surveys tab and then guide to NAS products and services, and under prices and methodology, you'll find that 300 page document that includes all of our information about how we collect price information for crops, livestock, and do all the price indices. It's very thorough, very comprehensive, very detailed and has weights of different commodities, things like that, everything. It's very, very comprehensive as a 300 page document to show and to be very transparent of our entire prices program. Next slide, please. To give an overview of the prices program, the, we have commodity prices as Lance talked about and Travis a little later. And we also have a prices received index and a prices paid index and then parity prices. As you may be seeing the news a little bit about Parity prices, if the farm bill isn't signed and then uh, we go on without a farm bill or an extension, uh, the dairy is the first item to kick in. So the price of a gallon of milk could be $60, $70, things like that if the farm bill isn't passed and other, other safeguards aren't in place. So parity prices still come into play uh, for legislation these days. And prices received and prices paid uh, are a combination of those well, prices received, of course, are a combination of what farmers receive from the commodity prices. And the prices paid index is really uh, the opposite, what farmers are paying for inputs to produce commodities. So those indexes together are what we do in our branch. Next slide, please. Just to give you a quick snapshot of where we are and a little bit of history of the trends. Um, this is a slide of the prices paid and received index based on 2011 is the base year. That's the last time we had a base year for our indices. And so that would be where, where we start at. So you can see um, it's been kind of steady in 2022, of course, you know, we kind of joke that every time during a census year, something unusual happens like a drought or something. Well, in 2022, we had quite a bit of rising prices, unlike we've seen in, well, obviously 10 years or more. So 
there has to be something special that we just get it one snapshot once every five years. But it seems like, you know, with the luck of the draw, always something unusual happens during a census year. And you can see the spike in prices received and prices paid as well happened in 2022. Next slide, please. And this is a slide of the NAS prices received index by crops and livestock. You can see this, this is what comprise you can compare crops and livestock. These slides are also available on our website. And you can see the difference between, you know, in 2015, you can see there was quite a bit of difference between the livestock production it was much higher than the, the crop indices. So it kind of compares how well, in a way, how well, you know, and much profit there is between crops and livestock. So that track's fairly consistent, but especially when there's a break like there is recently, um, it, it tells an interesting story about agriculture. Next slide, please. And this is really the prices paid index with uh, production items, and then of course all items, the interest tax wages. So it uh, just shows, and again, in 2022, what we saw a spike in prices received, and of course prices paid. The so farmers paid a lot more for their inputs, like feed, fertilizer, labor, everything else. So all that shows a spike. It combines all those commodities, everything together to give just an overall well-being indicator of farmers what they're what they're paying for products and also what they're receiving in the prices paid part. Next slide, please. And we also have something that's very important, the, the farm labor data that's also used. Um, you know, we produce our statistics independently and however anybody else uses them, we don't track them, we don't work in conjunction with other agencies, but uh, one of the big uses of farm labor data related to prices, the H2A program and the Department of Labor uses our report after it's published in public form, then they go out and create the H2A wage rates and that based off of the results of our survey data. Next slide, please. And again, this is our portfolio. Uh, like I say, we have everything from cash rents, all sorts of economic items and uh, arms. I would just wanna to mention to you the arms survey. Uh, what it is, it's agricultural resource management survey. It's really a farm production expenditures survey. So that's an annual survey where we provide, I think it's 25 states and region estimates of farm expenses. And then the economic research service works with us and they produce, um, use that data and other data, of course, to produce many reports throughout the year of economics. And I'm sure you, most of you are very familiar with the ERS data products. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Next slide. And I think that's it. So in I will turn the next portion over to Travis Averill. Go ahead, Travis. Thank you, so, Tony. Good afternoon. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. And next, I, we welcome Travis Averill. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gal. Good afternoon. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be part of this webinar to discuss livestock and poultry reports at USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service. Next slide. So I'll provide a high level overview of the branch and then get into more specific details pertaining to livestock and poultry reports. Next slide. Just to get, give you an overview of the livestock branch at NAS, uh, it's split into two sections, uh, livestock section and the poultry and specialty commodity section. And just a couple things to uh, point out, like Lance shared in his presentation, is the frequency of the releases. Uh, and the releases range from weekly, monthly, uh, quarterly, semi-annual, and annual reports across the branch. And the livestock section has seven commodities of responsibilities on an annual basis. And the poultry, especially the commodity section, has 12 commodities that we publish on it at some type of frequency basis throughout the year. And uh, both sections, as Tony and Lance have alluded to, um, have, have commodities related to organic and the census of agriculture commodities too. And today I wanna focus on production and prices over time for the commodities I have listed here in both sections. So there'll be seven releases I'll focus on. Um, some of them I actually did not provide prices um, components to it because I think uh, the key is the, the production and that will somewhat help um, provide how things are changing with time. And so next slide. 
So the first one I want to uh, talk about is the cattle release. Uh, NAS publishes this in January and July. Uh, the January is a larger sample and we publish all 50 states during that time frame. Whereas in the July release, it's a subsample of the sample that was used in January. And we only publish at the US level. And so to the left of all of the charts I'm going to be providing today is the inventory value on the left side. And so the chart provides the cattle inventory with the blue line. And just to note, there were two breaks in the inventory series due to reduced funding that prevented the July 2013 and July 2016 surveys from being conducted. So that's why you see those breaks in the time series here. Now the secondary axis, I have the orange circle which represents the annual calf crop. And then the gray triangle is the annual cattle slaughter by head. And I think those are two components that are helpful to see how the inventory in the um, industry is moving. Uh, you can see that when the inventory goes down into a valley, that typically the slaughter decreases. And then you, um, if the herd is rebuilding, calf crop starts to uh, expand year over year. And that's illustrated in the orange circles. Next slide. And so something I, I'm going to share in today's presentation, which I think is good to see. Some of these are going to be um, not as much variation from slide to slide on the uh, rankings of top 10 states or top five states, depending on which quantity I'm presenting on. But here, uh, since 2014, the cattle inventory for the top 10 states as of January 1, uh, the top three states have not changed over that time frame. And however, California and Oklahoma have swapped rankings, as has Iowa and South Dakota. So I just think it's good to see what states, how production uh, does change over time or can, is changing with various industry commodities in the United States. Uh, next slide. So following from the cattle, it just uh, is easy to move into the cattle on feed survey. That is a monthly process. NAS collects data uh, in 16 states with 12 of them being published and the other four being accounted for in the uh, phrase other states in our publications. You can see the uh, inventory is the uh, blue line since January 2012. And you can see the seasonal trends and impacts vary based on the cattle inventory and supply. Then on the secondary axis, I have the orange line, which is the place monthly placements. And you can see that there's more variability in that orange line versus the green and along with the inventory. Those higher months are typically dependent on the cabin season. Um, and environmental um, conditions like weather um, and feed supply, feed costs, where some of those will play a factor in the movement of cat, cattle into the feedlots. And then the green line is the monthly marketings, which has less variability, though it's just one thing to point out. You can see that dip back in 2020 uh, during the pandemic. Uh, there was some negative impacts back there that were um, caused based on uh, health conditions that were a priority, so there was less cattle being marketed. Next slide. So the top 10 cattle on feed inventory states, uh, top six have remained relatively unchanged. I just point of emphasis, the time frame here was January 1. There have been times where during certain months the changes could be uh, Kansas, Nebraska, or Texas. Some of those have flipped those rankings that are illustrated here, but just to note the top 10 states were the same until um, January 1 of 2023, where Washington overtook the 10th spot and South Dakota fell out. Next, here is an overview of the hogs and pigs. Uh, the frequency of this report is quarterly, March, June, September, and December. We also refer to December as the annual report, which uh, counts for all 50 states, whereas in the quarterly states, we go after the quarterly states and it's a smaller subsample of the de December sample itself. Inventory is the blue line on a quarterly basis and it kind of goes back and uh, ties in with um, the price indexes that Tony just alluded to on the livestock components. This one here is somewhat a factor in that um, spike that he showed back in 2014-15 uh, some of that is uh, re related to the hog industry because in 2013-14, the, uh, 
there was a disease issue with PED that impacted the industry. Uh, though the in inventory has continued to expand into, through um, 2020, and since then the industry has experienced ret retraction in the pig herd. Uh, the orange circles is the annual pig crop, and the gray triangles are the annual hog slaughter. And so you can see up until 2020, the uh, pig crop was expanding um, year over year, typically other than the PED impact and slaughter there was impacted that, that had that drop in the volume annual hogs being slaughtered that time frame. So next slide. For the top 10 states for hogs and pigs, again, this has been relatively stable. You can see Iowa is number one. There was a change in 2022 where Minnesota took the number two spot over North Carolina. And then you can see Nebraska and Missouri had a flip flop in 2018. Uh, and then South Dakota has come into the top 10 in 2021, whereas Kansas has dropped out of the top 10. Next slide. So milk, milk production, uh, it, it, this is published monthly, although NAS actually only surveys the producers on a quarterly basis at being completed in January, April, July, and October. The non-quarterly months, uh, NAS it relies on administrative data from various sources where we collect the production and average daily um, pounds produced per cow to help uh, alleviate that because that helps reduce the burden on our producers. So we're not having to survey them on a monthly basis, but however, still able to publish the data in a timely manner to have them have data accessible. And so here, the, the data is from 2010 to 2023. If you can go to the next slide, I think this is a little easier to see is when I just showed a smaller window from 2019 to 2023, you can see more of the seasonality and monthly changes in production. But the one thing to take away from here is the prices. Um, the, since 2010 to 2023, the highest price was actually in May of 2022 at $27.20. And the lowest price was also in May of 2020 at $13.60. So next slide. Top 10 producing states for milk production have remained the same states. However, rankings have altered with time. Uh, just know California, I take the top two. And then there's been a little more variation from the rankings three to eight. Um, and New Mexico and Washington have wrapped up the top 10. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next few slides, I'm going to cover the poultry components that are part of today's presentation, first being egg production, and then I'll follow up with weekly broilers and finish with turkeys raised. So chickens and eggs is the survey that provides the egg production, and that is conducted on a monthly basis. Uh, and so here, egg production monthly since January 2010 is green. A couple of things here, go back to the price indexes that Tony mentioned. Those timeframes, 2015, uh, there was uh, HPAI outbreak in the United States. And again, we had that disruption in 2022 to production. So when there's a direct disruption to the production, uh, prices go up. And so those are the two components, the PED with hogs, along with the HPAI in 2015, 2022, that um, are influences on the livestock price indexes. On the second, Secondary axis is the monthly egg price per dozen in gray. Uh, most prices since 2010 have been below the $1.80, except during those two outbreaks. Next slide. The top 10 egg producing states since 2014 have differed compared to um, the prior commodities I've presented today. Just the one, there's three states that have been fairly consistent where Iowa, Texas, and Georgia have remained um, at first, fifth, and sixth in the U.S. ranking over the last 10 years. And uh, just a couple states have uh, shuffled around and California has been removed from the top 10 after 2021. Next slide. So, so NAS conducts a weekly uh, broiler hatchery report that captures uh, egg set, chicks hatch, and chicks place. Uh, this data is from uh, hatcheries 
where the um, hatcheries will play, um, hatch at least 1 million chicks on an annual basis. The annual production for chicken and broilers has been on a, has been a linear incline since 2013, uh, although there's a slight dip in 2015 due to the HPAI and a drop in 2021. The prices uh, per pound for broilers has ranged from 36 cents in 2020 to as high as 84.6 cents in 2022. Next slide. The top 10 states for broiler placements since 2013 have remained the same states, and the top four states have remained unchanged with Georgia, Alabama, Arkansas, and North Carolina um, being the top four producers. Next slide. Turkeys raised is conducted September and February. Uh, data for turkeys raised estimates are collected for known operations raised in 1,000 or more turkeys annually. NAS publishes this in the Turkey's Raise Report in September, and then in April in the Poultry Production and Value Report, we'll also have the Turkey's Raise um, production on the annual basis. And production has been on the decline since 2017, whereas prices have been increasing since 2019. Uh, production high in 2012 was at 253.5 million, and as low as 210 million this past year in 2022. The prices have ranged from 51 cents in 2018 to as high as $1.06 per pound in 2022. Next slide. The top five turkey raised states are more consistent than the other commodities I've presented today. You can see that the only changes have been in 2014 and 2020 where Arkansas was number two, North Carolina went to three, but they reverted back to the, what they've historically been for production levels. The next slide. I think, thanks for the opportunity. Now we'll turn it back to you, Gal. You, the audience, and everyone else, that immediately following this, you'll be sent a follow-up survey. The feedback is very, very important to us in understanding how our future programs and offering can better help serve you. And it only takes less than a minute, and we do appreciate your efforts. Next slide, please. Before we wrap up, we encourage you, especially if you enjoy this webinar, to sign up for our newsletters and other social media communications. Uh, you can simply search on most social platform, CFAIR or CFAIR.org, and you can find us. Also, a recording of this webinar will be available in the coming week or two on YouTube, and we'll notify all those that registered uh, of the event. And finally, we strongly encourage, and we'll be making our utmost effort to respond to any comments or suggestions or inquiries sent to us. So feel free to email us at information at cfair.org. If, even if you want us to contact you, us, yeah, you to one of the speakers, We'll be happy to assist as well as try to answer any inquiry or questions you might have. Next slide, please. This is very important. We want to offer a big, big thank you to our partner. This and other CFER programming would not be possible without the continuing support of the Agriculture and Applied Economic Association, the AAEA the U.S. Department of Agriculture and National Agricultural Statistical Service, NAS, as well as USDA Economics Research Service, ERS. Your support is greatly appreciated and very helpful to our activities. Next slide, please. A big thank you to our, part, to our panelists, which uh, offered us a lot of information and a lot of uh, things to think about and a very interesting uh, overview of NAS, its activities, and the various uh, sectors it focuses on. Lastly, we want to thank you, the audience. We're passionate about this subject, and we think you are too, but it's not a small thing to give up an hour of your time and spend it with us. We hope you enjoyed this event as much as we enjoyed hosting it, and thank you so much, and have a great day, everyone. Bye.